Our study of Paul's letter to the Galatians brought us several weeks ago to that portion of the letter where the Apostle describes the kind of life that the Gospel produces. He's describing practical Christianity here in chapter 6, and he does so in very specific terms. And according to what Paul writes here in chapter 6, the Christian life is, among other things, a life of love. As he says elsewhere, in 1 Timothy 1, verse 5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. John writes in 1 John 4, in verse 16, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Jesus said that the first and greatest commandment is supreme love to God and sacrificial love to others. So when it comes to gospel religion, when it comes to true religion, love is the thing that matters most. If our religion doesn't make us to be loving people, and over time if it doesn't make us to be more loving people, then what use is it? What good is it? Paul describes love in action here in chapter 6. He describes the kinds of actions which love will prompt one to perform. And the very first action he describes is in verse 1, restoring others who sin. Verse 1, the Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Love will prompt one to correct others at times and confront them with a view to restoring them from sin that they may have committed. Love wants other people to have a good conscience before God and men. Love wants other people to enjoy a healthy relationship to God and a healthy relationship to Christ. Love will not leave other people alone in their sin, but will confront them and correct them humbly, gently, and faithfully with a view to their restoration, not their condemnation, but with a view to their restoration. And then last Lord's Day, we took up a second action prompted by love, and that is bearing the burdens of others. That's found in verses 2 through 5. We only went as far as verse 2. And we took verse 2 and divided it, and divided it in half. And I unpacked it underneath two headings. First of all, there's an injunction stated. And secondly, in the second half of the verse, we have an incentive presented. The injunction stated in the first part of verse 2 tells us, Bear one another's burdens. And we noted the connection between chapters 5 and 6. A very important connection between these chapters. Those who walk by the Spirit, verse 25 of chapter 5, are the same people who restore others to sin, in verse 1 of chapter 6. And they are also the same people who bear the burdens of others, verse 2 of chapter 6. And so restoring others who sin and bearing the burdens of others, these are among the several marks of a life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's the uh, injunction stated. And then after that, we looked at the incentive presented in the latter part of verse 2. And the incentive to obey the injunction presented is uh, in the latter part of the verse. It says, thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Those who bear the burdens of others, Paul tells us, are those who are fulfilling the law of Christ. That is, they are fulfilling the law which Jesus Christ himself taught and exemplified. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, believers are not like pagans, they're not Uh, against law or without law like pagans. Neither are they under law like Jews. But he tells us there that they are in law to Christ. 
They are connected to the law. They're bound to the law, the law of Christ. They're bound, in other words, to the moral law of God. The requirements of the law of Christ are essentially the same as the the requirements in God's moral law. Those requirements are not essentially different. And we know this because those who bear the burdens of others fulfill the law of Christ and they are the same people who walk by the Spirit so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in them. And we learn that from Romans 8 and verse 4. So the requirements of the law of Christ and the requirements of the moral law of God are not essentially different. They are not two different laws. And so here's a powerful incentive for bearing the burdens of others. As we bear the burdens of others, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. And this is something that honors Jesus Christ. This is something that pleases Christ. This is something that emulates Jesus Christ. We are like Him if we are fulfilling His law. And so we are to love one another by bearing one another's burdens just as Christ loved us and has borne the burden of our sin. Well, that being the case, this morning we come to the all-important question. If we're to love one another by bearing one another's burdens, here's the question. How do we do that? How do we bear the burdens of others? In terms of specific things, in terms of particulars, how do we bear the burdens of others and thereby fulfill the law of Christ? Well, we do this in at least three ways. Three ways. First of all, we bear the burdens of others by being ready and willing to forfeit what is legitimate and allowable for us to enjoy if it will truly help them. This is the first thing. We bear the burdens of others by being ready and willing to forfeit or forego what is legitimate and allowable for us to enjoy if it will truly help them. Let's turn to Romans chapter 15 to demonstrate this principle. Romans chapter 15, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Romans 15, and we'll start with verse 1. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now, if I were to ask you, what subject is the Apostle Paul dealing with here in the context in Romans 14 and about the first half of Romans 15. What subject is he dealing with? I hope that without too much hesitation, you would know from your general knowledge of the book of Romans that Paul is dealing with a subject we commonly call Christian liberty. Christian liberty. And apparently in the church at Rome, there were differences of opinion about matters that that in themselves were neither good nor bad. And there were differences about these things. And there were one group, they were weak, as Paul calls them. And then the other group, on the other side of the question, they were the strong. Well, Paul's dealing with the subject of Christian liberty. And, and, and it's important for us to interpret those terms, weak and strong, in the way that Paul means them in the context. Those who are strong, Paul is referring there to people who are strong in faith. They could eat meat as well as vegetables. They could eat almost anything. They were strong in faith. We could say that they were believers where they more robust faith, a more robust conscience. And then the weak are those who are weak in faith. These are people that were much more scrupulous about things. They couldn't eat meat. They would eat only vegetables. And so here at Rome, there were strong people. They could eat anything. The weak could only eat vegetables. Both groups had their strengths, and both groups had their weaknesses. They had their liabilities. The strong might be tempted to resent the weak. Here they are stepping on my liberty. Who do they think they are? And so the strong might tend to to view them with contempt. And the weak 
they might be tempted to, uh, to judge their, their, their brothers who had more liberty. If you look back in chapter 4 and verse 3, this was exactly the problem. The one who eats, Paul says, is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. So here are these two groups. They have differences with each other. How does Paul resolve the differences? How does he work this out? Well, you'll notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't take sides. He doesn't say, well, these folks over here, you're right. You folks over here, you're wrong. You need to change and follow these folks over here. And Paul isn't doing that just to be, be uh, uh, diplomatic and, and, and pe- you know, peacemaking. He, 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 would, he would take a stand on an issue. If it was a matter of right or wrong, he would take a clear stand on that issue without hesitation. But these issues that were in view didn't require that kind of a stand. And so Paul doesn't take sides. He doesn't come with his apostolic authority and declare one group is right and one group is wrong. But rather, what he does is he presents them with a principle and a pattern. A principle for them to think about and a pattern for them to look at and imitate. The principle is the principle of walking in love. Chapter 14 and verse 15. He points out there, if because of food your brothers hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. If you're more concerned about your appetite and satisfying your belly and somebody else is hurt because of it, you're not walking according to love. And then he also sets before them the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what we read in verse 3 of chapter 15. For even Christ did not please himself. And so here are the strong. The strong are under obligation to bear with those who are weak. And that's the very same word that Paul uses in Galatians 6 and verse 2 where he talks about bearing the burdens of others. It's the Greek verb bastazo. Same word. Neither group is to please himself but his neighbor. And why are they to do that? They're to do that because this is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ has done with us. Christ has not pleased himself. He did not please himself. But he bore the burden of the sins and the reproaches of others. Not his own sin. He had no sin. But he bore the burden of the sins of others. He didn't look out for his own interests. But he looked out for the interests of others. Bless God that Christ did not please himself. Have you ever praised God for that? That Christ did not please himself? But he willingly went to the cross and bore the burden of our sin. Bless God that he didn't just walk out of the upper room and walk away. But he did his father's will. He stuck with it. Bless God that he didn't just walk away out of the Garden of Gethsemane and walk away and disappear. But he did his father's will and went to the cross and bore the burden of our sin. Now what is all this? have to do with bearing the burdens of others, our obligation to bear the burdens of others. Just this. It's this. If I really love my burdened brother, if I really love my burdened sister, how can I think about pleasing myself first? In all the dozens of little ways that we please ourselves, we have all kinds of little ways to please ourselves, don't we? And some of these little things we do, they're they're really little things. But they're things we like. And sometimes those little things are big things because sometimes we put those little things before the welfare of our brothers and sisters and other people. And if we truly love others, if we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, while they're struggling and bearing with some burden, then how can we think about pleasing ourselves first? Christ didn't please himself, but he bore my sin. He bore my reproach. He bore my burden. So how can I look upon a struggling, beloved brother or sister in Christ while they're agonizing and struggling under some kind of a burden and think about pleasing myself first? 
You know, that's kind of like a husband who lets his wife bring in all the groceries from the car. She comes back and she brings in all the groceries. She struggles bringing in all the heavy groceries all by herself while he sits and watches the TV set. It's kind of like that. Somebody else has a burden, but I'm going to please myself instead of sharing that burden. You see, if we're going to bear the burdens of others, it means we have to deny ourselves. Self-denial is required for burden bearing. It's the same self-denial that's required for for the the proper exercise of Christian liberty, isn't it? So Christian liberty, or whether we're talking about bearing the burdens of others, requires self-denial. It's the same self-denial in both cases. And self-denial does not involve primarily things that are sinful. If you deny yourself of something that God says you shouldn't have, that's not self-denial, biblical self-denial. Self-denial is in things that are legitimate. Things that aren't necessarily sinful. We're talking here about forfeiting or foregoing entirely valid, legitimate, lawful, allowable things. That's what self-denial involves. It's not self-denial to to forfeit a sin. We should never think like that. But self-denial involves forfeiting what I may in some sense have a right to enjoy. It involves forfeiting things that are lawful, things that are permissible. You know, everyone will agree that they'll agree that Christians ought to exercise self-denial. But when you start pointing out specific things in which they ought to deny themselves, then that's where the disagreement starts. You know, you ought to deny yourself. Agree. I think you ought to deny yourself in this or this or this. Now, wait a minute. You know, it's okay for me to have those things. It's all right for me to do those things. Don't you tell me I can't do that. You are stepping on my liberty. You are lording it over my conscience. You can't do that. These are legitimate things. I don't have to give these things up. That person is missing the whole point. Self-denial is always in things that are legitimate and allowable. And that's where the sacrifice comes in. That's where the pinch comes in. Self-denial is never in things that we shouldn't be doing anyway. It's in things that are valid. Things that we might be able to do. Things that are lawful. And this is one way in which our love is tested and proven, isn't it? Right here. Whether or not we are willing to give up things that are lawful for us. For the benefit of another. Love is willing to sacrifice. Love is willing to give up what it has a right to. Love is willing to be inconvenienced. Love is willing to, be, to have to go out of its way for someone else so that you can help someone else carry their burden. And so I want to ask you this morning, have you been inconvenienced by anyone recently? Can, can you think of anyone who inconvenienced you this past week? Can you think of anyone that you, were, um, you had to go out of your way for? Are there people in your life whom you regularly have to go out of your way for? Anybody that you're willing to sacrifice for? Anybody? Some of you can probably think of specific people. Yes, there's this one, this one, this one. And and regularly, I go out of my way for this person. But maybe some of you are having a hard time thinking about going out of your way for anybody at all. Being inconvenienced by anybody at all. In fact, maybe you have so many burdens of your own and so many desires and so many needs of your own that it's rare that you bear the burdens of others. You expect other people to bear your burden. Maybe you find you have little or no time to bear the burdens of others. Do you ever offer to help other people bearing their burdens? Do you offer to help You see somebody who's struggling. You you see a need. You see it. Do you offer to help or do you wait to be asked? 
And then even then, when you're asked, it's with reluctance and grudging. Mom asks you for some help, and you go, okay. Somebody asks you for help, okay, I guess. You know, it's not cheerful. It's not willing. Grudging and reluctant. We aren't going to view this matter rightly until we view it in the light of the cross. We have to view the matter in the light of the cross. Paul, when he comes to Christian liberty, he plants the cross right in the middle of this discussion of Christian liberty. That's what he focuses on. The same can be done with the matter of bearing the burdens of others. We need to think about the cross. There are so many, many practical areas where this principle comes to bear not just Christian liberty, but bearing the burdens of others. Self-denial. If only we would remember when the time comes, remember those words, Christ did not please Himself. Christ did not please Himself. You see somebody needs some help? Christ did not please Himself. Somebody asks you for help? Christ did not please Himself. You're busy with stuff. Somebody else has a need. You've got to get up and help them. Christ did not please Himself. If only those words would come back to our minds and our hearts when they need to. If only those words would influence us more powerfully than they do. Christ did not please Himself. Thank God that Christ did not please Himself. Where would you and I be right now if Christ had pleased Himself? And this has a wide variety of applications to us. From the music we listen to. There's some kind of music I like. I don't think you'd particularly like it. So, you, you know, when you're around, I'm not going to play it. <laughs> music we listen to. People we sit at with the fellowship dinner. You know, and we get downstairs. And, and there's a tendency sometimes to sit with certain ones the other folks you don't necessarily want to sit with too, too quickly. The people that we take time to talk to when we're here together on a Lord's Day, there's some folks we don't always go to those folks and take the time to talk to them, go out of our way to greet them, speak to them, make them feel welcome. And it even extends to the, the effort we make To carry the burdens of others and help them carry their burdens. Christ did not please himself. Let us not please ourselves. But let us please our neighbor for his good to his edification. This is the first way that we can bear the burdens of others. We bear their burdens by being ready and willing to forego or to forfeit what is legitimate and allowable for us to enjoy if it means they will truly be helped. And if it won't help them, if we're called upon to do something that isn't really going to help them, then forget it. Enjoy your liberty. That's fine. But if you're in a position to help someone else carry his or her burden, then do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it's in your power to do it. That's the first way. There's a second way in which we can bear the burdens of others. We bear the burdens of others by emotionally identifying with them in their distress. It's by emotionally connecting with them and emotionally identifying with them in their distress. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 12. Just a couple of chapters back. Romans chapter 12. And verses 15 and 16. Verse 15 of Romans 12. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Now Paul here is describing Christian sympathy. That's what we would call it. Christian sympathy. And our English word sympathy comes from the Greek word sympatheo, which is made up of a preposition and a verb, soon meaning with, and pasco meaning suffer. So literally, sympatheo means to suffer with. And that, that's the idea in sympathy. You're willing to identify with the difficulties and the sufferings of someone else. Else, You're willing to suffer with them, suffer with them in their weakness and their difficulty. 
And this is what Christians ought to do with one another. They should be sympathizing with one another. As Paul says in verse 16, we should be minding the same things. Literally, that's what it means. Minding the same things. And Paul uses a word there that talks about the mind. But he's not talking about just thinking the same things, but it even involves feeling the same things. And that's clear from the context. Rejoicing with those who rejoice, weeping with those who weep. Christians ought to sympathize with one another. A sympathetic vibration must be set up among the people of God. I've used this illustration many times when I was in high school. I was in a concert band and a symphonic band. I was was in a percussion section and a snare drum. Somebody would blow a note on a trombone or a note on a trumpet or a baritone and they'd go up and down the scale and every so while they hit a note and the snare drum would it would vibrate louder than the other notes. That's a sympathetic vibration. It's resonance frequency for you physics physics fans. Resonance frequency. You hit that note and there's something about the structure of the drum and the atmosphere and the conditions that makes makes the snare drum vibrate. And that's what God's people should be like. A sympathetic vibration set up amongst God's people. We should all have the same resonance frequency when it comes to certain things. And you know, that requires a measure of self-denial, doesn't it? Because we think we have a right to feel the way we want to when we want to. My feelings are my own. I can't be a hypocrite. I can't flip my feelings on and off like a light switch. And that's true to some degree. It isn't absolutely true. Because you see, how we think influences how we feel. You know, suppose that I, suppose that I was able to uh, this afternoon I handed you uh, $100,000 cash. Boy, that would get an emotional response, wouldn't it? You'd probably be happy. Thank you, thank you. What if I told you it was stolen? I don't want it. Get it away from me. What kind of a man are you? You know, your emotional state would change immediately. It's all based on, on how you think. And we, we like to think that... that that my feelings aren't under my control always, my emotions. And we like to think that nobody has the right to tell me how to feel. Well, that's not true. God has a right to tell you how to feel, doesn't he? God can tell you how to feel. And, and God says right here in his word, he says, don't laugh when your brother or sister is crying. And if your brother or sister is laughing, don't you cry. That's really what God is saying. And sometimes we have to control ourselves and we have to adjust our emotional states to accommodate the emotional conditions of others. Jesus did this, didn't he? When Jesus was walking along and he saw multitudes of people who were suffering, it produced in him an emotional response. He couldn't just walk by suffering people and feel nothing. He didn't, he didn't say, well, today's a bright, sunny day and I've had a rough week and, and I'm going to just think happy thoughts even though I see the suffering over here. He was, he was sensitive. He was compassionate. He was full of sympathy. He still is full of sympathy. He identifies with us in our weaknesses and sufferings. This is why he's such a great high priest. Because he's able to sympathize with us. He knows the temptations and the difficulties that we undergo. And Jesus was full of compassion for people in distress. If we really love our friends, if we really love our family members, if we really love other people, then we're not going to be emotionally disconnected from them. Emotionally detached. Unconcerned. There won't be long periods of time where they aren't in our thoughts. If we love people, we think about them. We'll be thinking about what they go through. When we hear about something that they're experiencing, something in us is going to go out to them. If we hear that they're sick or they're having some kind of difficulty, we're not just going to be able to go our way unaffected, unconcerned. Not if we love them. And that's even in spite of the fact that great geographical distance might separate us. It's even in spite of the fact that that we may have a busy schedule. 
We're so busy. I've got so many things to do. And then you hear about this one, you hear about that. Oh, it's just one more thing. You're still going to feel something. Because you ought to. So this is the second way that we bear the burdens of others. We bear their burdens by emotionally identifying with them in their distress. Then there's a third way that we can bear the burdens of others. We bear the burdens of others by genuinely caring for them. Really caring. I mean, really caring. Really, really. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. And look at verses 25 and 26. Verse 25, we're breaking in the middle of a long sentence. He says, he's talking about um, the honor that's given to uh, members in the body of Christ or members of the body that we might consider less honorable. And verse 25, we break into the sentence. We do that so that there be, may be no division in the body, but the, that the members may have the same care for one another. And then verse 26, And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So Paul here is likening the members of the church of Christ to the physical members of your physical body. And when one part suffers, they all suffer. You know what it's like when you've got uh, an aching head or a bad finger or a bad tooth. It, it affects your whole being. It affects you as a whole. And so it is with the body of Christ. Again, there's to be a sympathetic vibration set up among the people of God. They're all to be connected. They're all to be in touch with one another. None are to be disconnected. None are to be off by themselves, out there, doing their own thing, disconnected. But what's described here in 1 Corinthians 12 is the connection that ought to exist among God's people. And this is more than just feelings. It's more than just feelings. And it's more than just verbal well-wishing. You know, sometimes we think, well, if I care for somebody, I'm just going to, well, God bless you. I'll pray for you. I hope the Lord helps, helps you. It's more than just that. It's more than just verbal well-wishing. It's genuine care. Care that is sometimes demonstrated in actions. So these are three ways in which we bear the burdens of others. We do it by being ready and willing to forfeit legitimate things, allowable things, if it will help them. We do it secondly by emotionally identifying with others who are in distress. And thirdly, we do it by genuinely caring for people. Burden bearing is very much about sacrifice and self-denial. It's about identifying with others in their needs, in their sorrows. It's about feeling pain and the difficulty of what others are experiencing. As though it was your own. That's burden bearing. We bear the burdens of others. That means their burdens become our own. We cannot be bearing the burdens of others if we're not taking any part in their burdens. We cannot bear the sufferings of others unless we are suffering ourselves, unless we're willing to suffer to some degree ourselves. And if we're not burdened ourselves, then we're not sharing anybody else's burden. If we don't feel the weight and feel the difficulty, we're not really bearing the burdens of others. Well, now in the time that remains, I would like for you to consider with me just one general line of application And we're going to trace it out in many particular ways. Last Lord's Day, if you were here, you will remember that I pointed out that the God who calls us to bear the burdens of others is himself the very greatest burden bearer of all. God has has borne the very greatest burden of all. He's borne the burden of the sins of his people. And he calls us as his people to bear the burdens of others. Now we're going to turn that around. And make some applications. The God who has borne our very greatest burden calls us to bear the burdens of others. God has borne our burden 
our very greatest burden, our biggest problem. And now he calls us to bear the burdens of others. Let's turn first of all to 1 John chapter 3. In verses 16 and 17. 1 John 3, verses 16 and 17. This is really what John is saying in these verses. What I just said, this is what John is saying. Verse 16. We know love by this, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? How is love expressed? It's expressed by bearing the burdens of others. And John here points us to the love of God in Christ. That's the first place he points us. Christ has laid down his life for us. Application, we ought to lay down our lives for for our brothers and sisters. And if we see others in need, and we close our heart, and we just turn away from them, how does the love of God abide in us? Love is expressed in bearing the burdens of others. And I'll say this. This right here is one of the surest evidences that one is a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Some of you, from time to time, may struggle with assurance of salvation, whether or not you really know God through Christ. John wrote this letter for that purpose. He he wrote this letter to lay out evidences of what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, so that those to whom he writes may know whether they have eternal life. Chapter 5 and verse 13. And here's one of the ways we can know. Do you bear the burdens of others? Do you have some capacity? Is it part of your, 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 your regular habit and practice? Is it a pattern with you to bear the burdens of others, to enter into their concerns, and to help them carry the burdens that are upon them. Now understand, bearing the burdens of others, isn't the, it doesn't save us. That doesn't make us a Christian. You can bear all the burdens you want. It doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't save anybody. Bearing the burdens of others doesn't secure acceptance before God. It doesn't earn any favor from God. It isn't just something that comes naturally. We're not talking about that either. Some people are just more naturally compassionate than others. We're talking here about something that's wrought in you by the Spirit of God. It's an evidence that you really are in Christ. It's an evidence of God's working in your life. So this should be something that can encourage you. Are you a burden bearer? If you are, that's an evidence that you are in Christ. It's an evidence that you are a true Christian if you're a burden bearer. Do you like to help others sharing their burden with them? Because you love them. It's here's the, the key, the motive. You do this because you love them. And you care about them. And you want to honor God by helping them. Are you a burden bearer? Take that as an evidence of God's working in your life. At times you may lack a sense of acceptance with God. You may lack... Assurance of that acceptance. Here's something to look for. Bearing the burdens of others. Love in your heart that springs from compassion. Compassion that has to act. You ever felt compelled, I must do something? I feel this compassion. I see a need. I have to do something. I can't just walk away. I have to do something. This is what we need, isn't it? More compassion? Would anybody here say you got enough compassion? Oh, I'm compassionate enough. No, nope, no, nope, don't want too much. I got enough. We need more compassion, don't we? More compassion. Cry to the God who is full of compassion. Cry to Him to give you more compassion. Compassion that will make you want to help others carry their burdens. And in this way, Paul says we fulfill the law of Christ. And that's something every true believer ought to deeply desire to do, to fulfill the law of Christ. Here's why. Turn to John. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And these are, I think, some of the most wonderful verses in the whole Bible. 
these verses that we're going to read. John 14, verse 15. Jesus' words. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. What does that mean? Whatever it means, it must be something indescribably wonderful. And then verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, uh, you know, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. There it is again. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Those are wonderful words, aren't they? Some of the best words in the whole Bible. And Jesus here makes some rich promises. These are rich, heavy Pregnant promises to those who keep His commandments and fulfill His law. It ought to be a deep desire in our hearts to fulfill the law of Christ. And one of the ways we do this is by bearing the burdens of others. But that isn't easy to do, is it? It isn't easy to bear the burdens of others. It's especially difficult to bear the burdens of those people who seem to have nothing but burdens. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. And this is a verse that I still have a lot more to learn about. The Lord is teaching me, but I still have a whole lot more to learn about this verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14. We urge you, brethren... Admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. And there are always people in the church, aren't they? Outside the church too, but in the church. There's always people that seem to be nothing but a bundle of burdens. And they don't give too much, but they take a lot. There are such people in the church. They, they seem to be ready to take advantage of the kindness and the compassion and the generosity of God's people. There are some of us, we want to we bear the burdens of others. We want to be kind, but there's, there's others. They come to expect. They come to expect the kindness and the generosity of other people. There will always be people like that in the church. Now, we mustn't let such people take advantage of us because that's not righteous. However, neither must we be selfish and stingy and unwilling to help them. And that's the great danger. Sometimes we can be very stingy and unwilling to help others. This matter of bearing the burdens of others is not easy. And it's something that requires that we have a knowledge of other people. If we're going to bear the burdens of others, it means we have to know something about them. We have to have a knowledge of them. That means we need to be sufficiently in touch with others so that we know what's going on in their lives. So that we know what their burdens are. You can't bear a burden that you don't know anything about. You can't bear a burden that doesn't exist. You know, you don't know that it exists. You can't bear that burden. And so here's something we can ask ourselves. Are you connected enough with other people to know what their burdens are? Are you connected enough with other people to know what they're going through and what burdens they need help with? Or are you disconnected and out of touch? I know, I know, this all takes time. And we don't have a lot of time. But we've all got to examine, we've got to examine ourselves in this regard. Are you connected enough to know what's going on so that you can bear a burden if there is one? You know, bearing the burdens of others means looking out for other people. Sometimes we just want to look out for ourselves. We don't want to look out for anybody else. It means being your brother's keeper. It means sometimes knowing enough about your brother to be in his or her business. Not just thinking of yourself, but 
also taking time to be concerned about the interests of others. It, it means offering help, not waiting to be asked. It means that when you go to somebody's house, you offer to bring something. Contribute something to the meal. Bring something. Looking for ways to serve. Is there, is there anything that needs to be done? You go to mom and dad, wouldn't that blow their minds? Go to mom and dad, say, come down one evening, supper, mom's cooking. Anything needs to be done? Can I help with anything? But how wonderful that is. Instead of just sitting around waiting to be waited on. Do you do that? Do you sit around waiting to be waited on more than you offer to help others and minister to others? You know, downstairs, I can't help the fellowship dinner. Downstairs. Or when you're a guest at somebody's house. Or when you hear of someone at need, someone in need. You hear about a need. I wonder if there's something that I can do. Some needs we can't always minister to. We're not in that position, but I wonder if there's something I can do. What are some specific ways we bear the burdens of others? Well, I've got three categories here. I'm sure there's others. First of all, there's service. By donating actual time and energy to help people. Actually serving. Physically helping them. You know, caregivers? Caregivers are burden bearers. Some of us right now are caregivers. Some of us have been caregivers in the past. Caregiving, that's demanding. You want to find out how, how weak your love is? Just be a caregiver. You want to find out how selfish you are and how ugly your selfishness is? Just be a caregiver. But caregiving affords wonderful opportunities to learn about service and sacrifice. Caregivers have unique opportunities to learn about being like Christ. Service. Another way we can bear burdens is prayer. Intercessory prayer. Sometimes Christians are the biggest liars. They break the ninth commandment all the time and they lie when they tell people, I'll pray for you, and then they don't. But prayer is a wonderful way to bear the burdens of others. When you are burdened down with something, what a blessing it is to have somebody else pray for you. And to know other people are praying for you. Sometimes when I'm over in my study, and by Friday I'm, just, I'm in agony. What am I going to bring Sunday? Oh, these poor people, they have to hear this. I'm just agonizing. And then suddenly, something happens. Friday, Saturday, the burden gets lighter. I know somebody's praying. Pastor Ron's probably praying. Somebody's praying. It's good when, when people pray for you. So we should pray for others. But you see, in order to pray for others, you yourself have to be a praying person. You have to be in fellowship with God yourself. Otherwise, you're not going to be praying for others. You're just going to be a big hypocrite. If you're not in fellowship with God, how can you pray for anybody else? How can you bear their burdens? And then a third way we can bear burdens is fellowship. By actually spending time with people. Fellowship with them. By listening to them. Just listen. You don't, have to, you don't have to be the oracle dropping pearls of wisdom. Sometimes just listen to folks. It's nice to come up with a text of scripture or some, something that you think will help them. But sometimes we, we just don't have it. Just listen to them. Comforting them. Encouraging them. Going to them with words of comfort and encouragement. Reassuring them if you know they're struggling with something. Reassure them. Expressing your love for them. Visiting them when they're sick. Visiting them in the hospital. Fellowship. Just get with them. Call them on the phone. Send them a card. Send them a letter. Send them an email. Send them a text. Whatever, whatever you like to do. But fellowship is a wonderful way to bear burdens. So as we finish up this morning, let me ask you this. Are there any burdens you need to bear? Are there any people who have burdens that you need to help with? As we've been talking about this, thinking about this this morning, are there any faces that have come to mind? Any names of people 
come to mind? Maybe a friend or a loved one? You know, you might be pretty good at burden bearing in, in, with these people in some of these areas, but boy, there's this person over here. I've really been neglectful there. Any burdens that you need to bear? And, and ask yourself this, what burden do you need to help them carry? What is, maybe it's the burden of an illness. Or maybe it's the burden of finances. Maybe you need to try to help them financially. Or maybe it's a burden of shared ministry. That can be a burden. Some folks in the church are involved in certain ministries. And not everybody is equally involved in every ministry. They don't necessarily have to be. But that is a burden. Do you share that burden? Do you think of it? Well, there's, there's this. Could I, could I do this in this ministry or that in that ministry? What kind of a burden do you need to help them carry? And here's another question. How do you need to help them with their burden? What, what kind of help do you need to give them? Praying for them? Fellowshipping with them? Or maybe by doing something more than that. Maybe more than just prayer and fellowship. But maybe actual service. May God help us. May God work in our hearts to help us to be more compassionate. More sympathetic, more caring people. More like Jesus Christ, the Christ who's loved us and borne our burdens for us. He bore the burden of our sin on the cross. May God help us to be more like Him. Then I want to close this morning with a word to our friends who are here who may not know the Lord Jesus Christ savingly. I want to ask you, Have you ever had the experience in your life of seeing your sin, your sin, as your very greatest burden? Ever had that experience? Of all the troubles, all the difficulties in your life, have you ever come to the place that my very greatest problem is my sin before God? Now there's a Christian. You you will not ever come to that experience unless you are a Christian. Your sin. And then... Have you ever come to the place of recognizing that that the one who can bear your burden is the Lord Jesus Christ and only Him? You can't bear your burden. Your sin is too great. Only Christ can bear your burden. And have you come to the place of casting your burden upon the Lord Jesus Christ? This burden of sin, which is so great, it is so painful, it, it has ripped you up. Your sin. Have you come to the place... Of saying there's only one per- there's only one being in the universe who can bear this burden. And it's not a family member, it's not a doctor, it's not the president, it's not a politician. The only one who can bear this burden is God Himself, Jesus Christ. And if you cast that burden upon Him, I pray and I trust that you will have those experiences that you will come to see. My greatest burden is my sinfulness before God. And and God is the only one who can bear this burden. He's the only answer to my sin problem. The Word of God says, God comes and He says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. You know, right now the Lord can be found. Right now He's near, but He will not be found the same way at all times. In the future He may not be found. He will not always be near the way He is now. Seek Him now while He may be found. Call upon Him while He's near. God calls everyone, everyone to leave their ways and their thoughts and return to the Lord. He says, forsake your way, forsake your thoughts and return to the Lord. And God says, if you do that, He will have compassion. If you do that, He promises He will abundantly pardon. Forsake your thoughts. Forsake your way. Return to the Lord. And He promises He will have compassion. And He will abundantly pardon. Let's take our hymn books and close by singing hymn number 189. Well, you don't have to take your hymn books. You know that. I'm going to take my hymn Hymn number 189. And let's stand together and sing.
pray. Our Father, how we thank You that You gave Your only Son that He might bear the burden of our sin, the infinite burden of our sin and our guilt, our iniquity, our transgressions against You, our law-breaking, our rebellion. Father, we thank You that He has borne that burden. And Lord, we recognize that You've called us to bear the burdens of others. Father, we're ashamed as we think of how selfish and self-centered we can be at times. Father, we need a fresh infusion of Your grace. We need more of Your love. We need to have more of a, a hearty awareness, consciousness of how great Your love has been toward us so that we might be willing to be inconvenienced and go out of our way to bear the burdens of others. Father, please help us to excel in this this love for others even more so than we have in days past. We pray that You grant us repentance, grant to us a fresh determination, a renewed desire to help others carry their burdens. Father, may our burdens become lighter as we share them with one another. May they become lighter. May the the heaviness of our difficulties and our trials and our our struggles be be cut in half. May, May they be diminished because of the willingness that we have to bear one another's burdens. Help us to do this, Father, and in this way, help us to fulfill the law of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.